Uh, so you have, so what we do we do last time? Uh, we sort of um, looked at gadgets, so reducing some constraints to different constraints, and in fact it turns out that an optimal gadget could be found by a linear program. The number of auxiliary variables was, if we had negation to the thing we were reducing to, like 2 sat and 2 lin, the number of auxiliary variables was to the number of satisfying assignments of this p, minus the number of primary is minus 1, and the constraints were exponentially in this. So this was easy for uh, to reduce from 3 lin. This number actually turned out to be just 3, so everything was very uh, nice and cozy. And then you could get optimal gadgets, or as a reduction from 3 lin to 2 sat, you could get optimal gadgets, which gave you these in approximability results, and these are the best known under MP completeness. And that's a challenge to do better. There are better things that no longer unique games, but that's a, sort of a different, uh, what is a different game. And then I discussed a little bit, could you possibly make a direct PCP? Maybe the fact that you have uselessness here, you know, you, you don't know just that you can satisfy everything, but everything is very uniform and nice. And that didn't seem to work, it gave simpler gadgets. And the last thing I was trying to outline is that, well, maybe we should start with the different starting points, and I call it the Hadamard predicates, proven hard by Chan. And then the point theory is that H7 is a very good predicate, but it's just eight accepting configurations. And eight, then this is 120. And then the number of constraints is large, and you have to do something clever if you're going to solve it. Any questions or comments or thoughts? No? So how hard is it to analyze this kind of thing, abstract the linear problem by hand versus by... Uh, I've never tried. So I've tried for this... The well even, well, even verifying a solution by hand is difficult, right, when you get to, to these kind of things. Right? Because then you, you're, you're writing down a gadget which has 120 auxiliary variables, and you're sort of hoping that the max cut of, or you know, the best tool in two in this would have certain problems. So right? so it's a lot of structure. Also, yeah, it's a lot of structure, but I couldn't do it by hand. I, I only do it by computer. Yes? Are there any gadgets you are changing, not one close to too many, but two closes to many? Uh, that's a good question. I don't, I, I can't, I can't say anything better than to think of this. So you have, if you have two things like this, you want to think of this as a constraint in six variables, right? You could do the same thing. Now we actually have six variables and we sort of, but then we have, Unfortunately, 16 satisfying assignments, and we're <laughs> starting the game. Okay, okay. But nothing prevents that. I mean, possibly you can do better by taking two, I suppose. I, I don't see how to rule this out. This thing would have more structure, which you conceivably can yeah. take two. Just, just, uh, there should be some worst case in, in the budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, you, you know, just to try to go around the worst case, you can do that. Right? That's an interesting question. Do you, so work on it. I don't know the answer. Um, okay, anything else from? So do these two to the number set assignment have anything to do with like the long code assignment? Because the number is the same. But so is there any kind of correspondence that you can see? Um, <coughs> the number of set. Well, the well, it's the same number, I suppose, right? Two to something, so it's an accident. right? It's the an number accident. of binary strings of a certain length. It's nothing, nothing special, I think. Okay, so then we'll, uh, what I want to do today first is I'll, uh, I'll want to prove empty hardness of this, uh, the thing I was stating here, saying that we want a better starting point here of, uh, with a very sparse predicate. And I started writing down eight seven before you came, but I got tired after writing down the first five. There should be three more strings here. 
All right, so these are the linear functions, and each string is given by an input. So these, you should take the product of the corresponding bits. So you have seven non-trivial linear functions of three inputs. And, uh, well, you get to And another way to say it is that this column, for instance, is the XOR of the two previous columns. This is a new fresh column. This guy is the XOR of, of this thing and that thing. That column is the XOR of this thing and that thing. And this column is the XOR of the three three things. So for the record, let me say that uh, So if you knew, assume the unique games conjecture, we already know that this predicate was, was a useless, that, you know, that it's hard to do. Um, I mean, it's not only approximation resistant, but you only get the uniform distribution in the negative case. And this was proved by uh, someone reading really and Travis on, under the unique games conjecture. And once they had done this, of course, you think about proving it under NP hardness, but this seemed completely hopeless. I'll convince you why this is hopeless, OK? Um. So we, we sort of know how to. What I'm going to prove is hopeless. Uh, first, I'll, <laughs> prove, I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you why it's hopeless to prove, and then I'll prove it. No, okay? what, what, are you, what, what is your statement? <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, now we, I, I've done a couple of these proofs, right? We don't know how, we know how, how the machine works. Right? We have a predicate in mind. We have this predicate in mind. And now we're just going to pick some, some, some things here. And some things here, maybe we'll have a couple of tables here, who knows? And we'll pick some questions, and then we'll make sure that, you know. Somehow we're gonna uh, Right, we know what these things should look like, right? We're going to ask a few questions. We're going to ask some in the small table. We're going to ask some in the big table. And then we sort of want to make sure that, you know, if we look at any i, you know, the corresponding bits, any coordinate, this should be accepted by our predicates. That's the way we set up these things, right? We've been doing it for a couple of times. And then in the end, we're going to ask, you know, the, f the corresponding bits in the tables and they should satisfy that these should satisfy and if in the negative case we'll assume we in fact want to say that any non-trivial product of this has a low expectation that's the way we set up these things right so Jan, I don't get what you are proving now that, that you yeah. cannot prove gap for this particular problem from the labor cover? Well, yes, I'm not being so formal. What I'm, we, we had... 
I'm not proving anything, okay? So I just sort of want to build up to chance result by saying he really needed a great new idea that goes beyond the technology we had so far, and the technology we so had so far was hopeless to prove what we proved. That's what I'm trying to prove. So that's why I first want to discuss how would we have gone about to prove his result if we only had the technology I've shown you so far. You mean hopeless to prove those better bounds for 2 set and... No, no, for now I, I left 2 set and 2 I just want to discuss, say, H7 here. We want to prove uselessness for H7. That you can create instances where it's hard to distinguish when you can almost always satisfy H7 and from those where you actually get the uniform distribution on the, eight bit, on the 7 bit strings when, for any proof. That's, am I making sense? Nut is not even nodding. You should nod nothing. I'm not making sense. So you're starting to prove that H7 is approximation resistant and yeah. you're going to show us that the proof fails and yeah. then you're going to fix it using the chance new ID. That's great! Does that make sense? <laughs> I'm just translating, I don't need to talk. That's fine. <laughs> What's that? Good, so how would we do it, right? We've seen how to do these proofs over and over again, right? And the idea is that, you know, we pick some strings to the left and some to the right and we make sure that, you know, if we look at them locally, you know, if you take, we have three inputs there and then we sort of have the, on the left side we need the projections and they should all satisfy HK, right? And then in the end we're going to take these big strings and feed them into our functions and our test will be to see if that satisfies HK. So how would we do in this case? So the first thing is those who did the homework, and Dominique is not here. So <laughs> <laughs> the first thing you have to decide on which sides do which questions go on, right? And then you sort of start fiddling. Okay. okay. So So any suggestions? You know, we, we now need seven positions. You know, how should we distribute them? between the two sides. Well, we should have some on both sides, that's clear, right? Because otherwise we're not really testing anything. Yeah. So, we have our favorite picture. You're going to steal on one side, and, yeah. and then you're going to be in Well, suppose we even have two on the small side. So we start here with some uh, some x1, which is here. Then we suppose we take this to be the first two. Then in fact we know that the fourth component is the xor of the first two, right? And this sort of says that we need the fourth bit also to live here because it's going to be essentially the X or maybe we could add some noise, but it's going to essentially live there. Okay. So if we have X1 and X2, That sort of means that we sort of have also here f u of And now when we're going to prove uselessness, right? We want to prove that any product of these bits we're going to read is going to be small. And in particular, we should prove that the product of these three bits is small. But if this is just a long code that's not consistent with anything here, this bit will be perfectly one and we'll have some... some, some so we can't prove that all characters are small. You mean if f is a linear function? Yeah, well, if f is a correct long code. 
So always the thing to th one th dangerous thing to think about is that these are inconsistent long codes. That's always a bad. That there's no that they are correctly specified. They're coding something, but they're coding nothing. Some, something has nothing to do with the level code. Yeah, and I, I don't understand one thing about this user since that. So you can prove some gap, right? Because you can prove if something has a gap, then you can prove that there is some gap. It is empty hard, isn't? Can't you? Like or or. Um, what I, I'm not sure what you mean, really. Well, that uh, starting from label cover. Yes. Uh, so if you have a problem, uh, an approximation problem, uh, which cannot be approximated with, like, let's say gap, I don't know, like 0 0.1, then you can at least prove that it cannot be approximated with 0 0.0001 or, well, some smaller gap, but you can still prove some MP hardness. Yeah, so you're right. saying for that every problem. So, 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 so there ought to be some where at least you achieve some some advance, right? Yes. But so you're saying that you maybe I should wouldn't get you know the perfect approximation resistant. That's hard to distinguish almost yeah. satisfiable, but I would get some other factor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this is definitely true because, for instance, the child predicate implies parity of the first, second, and fourth bit. Yeah, but if you are proving uselessness, doesn't it mean that you cannot prove any gap whatsoever? Or uselessness? Uselessness is the perfect gap, right? They're saying that even if you can satisfy everything, no character... I'm, I mean, in the good case, uh -huh. Uh -huh. these strings will almost always satisfy yes, so the predicate I, I have in mind, which is extremely sparse on top of it. Uh -huh. And in the bad case, this will be a uniformly distributed string, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. So uselessness is... I mean, does not imply, yeah, 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 yeah. okay, now I, I get. But, but, but if, if I was contenting yeah. just getting some appro in approximability for Chan, not getting this. Mm -hmm. So the perfect number now is like uh, 2 to the k over 2 to the 2 to the k minus 1, right? Mm -hmm. This is the fraction accepted, and this is the number of total string. This is what I'm going for, right? That's the approximability factor I want. Uh -huh. If I was happy with something smaller, I could get something, because I, the point is I can control some terms in this Fourier expansion. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I can embed the parity here, because just if I take a parity instance and put that in, in places 1, 2, and 4 in the predicate, yeah. that will at least give an inapproximability factor a half of, of also the Chan predicate. Uh -huh. Uh, good. Um, yes? The, well, the problem is that it's, if you put even two strings on the x side, you know, the, to satisfy this property, we'll have a third string on the x side. Okay? And this will mean I will have something that looks. And now, when I'm going to do useless lens, I want to do all products. In particular, I want to do the product of the three bits that all live on the on the on the f side. But if f on itself is just a, a, a long code that has nothing to do with the g side, this term will be big because the, right, it's just the parity of three bits and the parity of these strings is one, right? So I, I can't control this. And so this means I sort of should have only one string here if I'm going to have any hope of controlling things. And six guys over here. But then you start saying, well, now you just say, well, take a pr product of three G things here, of which I know the XOR. And if this is a correct long code, which is inconsistent with what I have here, I mean, I have some, I will have some XOR on these six bit that's also going to be biased. So I'm going to be screwed. Okay. Unless they're chosen independently, right? Well, how I'm going to choose things, I'm, I'll, I'll clearly want to choose. So I choose an x on this side, and then I'll choose why I want. And I need to make sure that things are like uh, x pi i, if I put this in the first place, and then I sort of have y2 
I Y6 I they should be existed by, by the, the, yes. the predicate, right? Yes. Because if they're not accepted by the predicate, no. okay? And this means particular that the, well, you, you can read off, right? I'm taking all these bits from the y side. Yes. And the XOR of these two guys, for instance, is that guy. Right, so the atmosphere is independent. Yeah, so there have so if I now ask f of x g of y one right? Yes So if we take some terms, a term like this, right? I'm now I'm going to take all the possible subproducts here. I want them all to be small, right? That's how I prove uselessness. So some guys will be easy to control. For instance, this one. These are in fact two independent bits now. So something like this will be easy to control. This will automatically be zero. Okay. And if you look at one like this, this is the first component, the second component. Uh, did I do this wrong? Yeah. Oh, sorry. This one is actually easy to control because these are independent. These guys are these first three positions. And uh, the third is the XOR of the first two guys. But also this guy we can control because this is exactly what we did in the parity analysis. This will have the same distribution as we had in the parity, so this will be easy to control. Um. Um. Well, on the other hand, This will be extremely problematic to control because these are three strings on the y side, which in fact are perfect XOR, and I can't control this. Somehow, yeah, we could sort of think of having two guys over here. Uh, yeah, you could sort of think what you want, right? But it, you always run into trouble somehow. So what you can do, what Travis and Samarinitsky did, is that well, we have unique games. And then, in fact, you can have one question in each place, and we're doing extremely well. Okay. But now, as long as we have uh, sort of a, a, a massive projections here, we're, we're in deep trouble, because we're going to get correlations and lots of stuff. So the, the, the thing we're going to do
it was going to take products of proof systems. And uh, so we'll have a proof system that we call a product of Q1 and Q2. We'll have questions. which are, you know, you pick a random question in, in each of the two proof systems. Actually, right, so, so in the first proof system we should have gotten t bits. So this is one. And in the second proof system, we should have also got in two bits. And we'll just take the, the, the product of these things. In the, I mean, the, the way the honest prover works for the honest system, we'll just take the product of these things. So the honest prover looks at the two questions, looks at, you know, the, see what, what the bit in each position should be, and it's just the product of, of the corresponding bit. Sorry, what are the questions? What do you mean product of two questions? Well, so let's, suppose we did what I just s said, right? We have one proof system. The, the proof system that we'll typically mm -hmm. have is that we'll take one question here and we'll take six questions over here, y1 to y6. And these are the questions, right? Mm -hmm. So then we'll have take another copy of the same proof system where we'll actually have start take pick a random new table here. We're gonna pick so this is sort of index one. And we'll ask one question here. And we'll pick a, a different guy over here, and we'll have uh, this should be two. Okay, six questions over here, and then a, a question will in the combined proof system a question will look like, and in fact we're going to put this guy in a different position. Well, well, it could look, we're going to change this soon, right? That a, a question in the combined proof system is, uh, I have one position here and one <laughs> position there. Please give me the, and write down the XOR of these two bits as the proof in, in the new proof system. Mm -hmm. And in the same, you know, you have six more questions here. Okay. Questions are like parallel but the answers you want not answers are separate questions for the XR. Yeah. Yeah. Want the, want the chocolate? Okay. So if this set of accepted strings is a subgroup, this works perfectly. Okay. So in the in the binary, this what by the way what I'm saying is going to work over any and I'm you know mod Q for mod or any in any group, but I'm going to do it in in the the XOR, okay? Right, because if you had an original proof system where this was to, expected to be in a strange set, and that was expected to be in a different strange set, when we had the pairwise product, it would be you know maybe everything that was acceptable. But if these belong to the same linear subspace, the pro I mean the pointwise product, which is just the sum, belongs to the same subspace, so we don't have to change the acceptance criteria, right?
So let's fairly prove system Q with the answers A1, Q1, to A. Well, this shouldn't be right. This is also. I wrote this poorly before. Or I would even say I wrote this incorrectly before, right? We sort of have, we're reading t different positions, right? I wrote this, like, all these as q1 before, they should be different. Okay? So the proof is the same, only the queries, like you are doing it to independent? It doesn't have to be the same. It could be any two proof system with two, any type two proofs. I'm, I'm going to use it with essentially the same written proofs, but it doesn't matter. But the verifier reads from, so when you are doing this transformation, yes. then you are not transforming the proof at all. Yes, yes, I am. Okay. So again, be 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 before I read the proof, right? Now I erased this. I should have erased oh, okay. this. Okay, okay, so you are just getting all products. <coughs> like if you have a proof one and a proof two, <coughs> then you are just getting basically the products of each bit. Yeah, so, so in So in in the old proof system I had typically six indexed by these things, right? And but now the proof bit will be sort of an indexed by U1, U2, X1, and X2. And the honest prover We'll write this as f u1 of x1 times f u2 of x2. Right? This is how he's going to complete this table index by these things. But what the dishonest, I mean, the, the unscrupulous prover does, we don't know. But it's, it, it is a new written proof. Yeah? And he has to take all the pairs of questions in the old one and write down what the answer should be there. That works, so you can multiply two proof systems, not only the labor cover, but like any two proof systems. Yeah, so the question you have to look at the acceptance criteria, right? What do you want from these t bits you write? You read. Well, if you want them to be in the particularly the same linear subspace in both these two proof systems, also this product string will be in the same. I mean, the product is just the XOR, right? I mean, I'm, I'm in the sense of in plus minus. So the product string will also be in the same linear subspace, so we get an interesting proof system. But in general, if you start with two proof systems that have very different acceptance criteria, you know, when you look at the corresponding strings, they, they won't have any structure. So that's why you really want, that's why he works so nicely with linear things, right? We, we're starting with a, with a linear subspace, and this would be very important for us. But yours is not quite a linear subspace, because you leave out the zero. No, it is a linear subspace. I mean, the code words is a linear subspace. I leave out the coordinate that's always zero, oh. right? No, I just erased this thing I was supposed sure, to point sure, off, sure, okay. right? But it is a linear subspace. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. Right, so what's, yeah, I should really, I mean, I, the best, we have a single proof, right, and we're asking, querying this proof in t places, so this is probably the correct way to read. Some expectation? Uh, some expectation, expectation, and, right, this is what we, how well, I mean, when we do this multilinear expansion of the predicate, how well will we do on a, on a certain term? Yeah. And now we have a lemma here.
So the claim is now that if we take the, the um, product of two proof system, in fact, for any particular character, we take the minimum, we get the minimum of these two things. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand what I'm asking. So, equality sign. So, so right. So when we're going to prove uselessness, right? We we have these t questions. And we're going to want to say that the distribution of these t bits is uniform. And that's saying that the expectation of any subset of these guys is unbiased, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll take one proof system and look at the, the bias of one character mm -hmm. on the answers. Mm -hmm. And what I'm claiming now is that if you take the product of two systems, we get the better of the two. You're happy with this statement? Product is I belongs to alpha, whereas I and I just needed a dot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's, it's a right. We have these. We have these t. We're asking these t bits. We're reading these t bits from the proof A. We're um, and now we're looking at the character of these. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I missed up notation there. Sorry. So let's let's prove that m alpha q1 times q2 is smaller than m alpha q1. And the idea of the proof is that if you just fix any value of q2, that gives a proof system for q1. And then we just have expectation over q1 and q2. And then, it's, should I do this? or? You? And of course, once you have this, uh, you can take the product of k guys and you get the minimum, I mean, the character is the minimum of the minimum of the k guys. K was So I was saying before, you know, when I was arguing about the, the proof system with one question on, on the x small side and six on the big side, I said, well, this term we can handle, this term we have problems with, that term we can handle. So now we just have to define a lot of, of proof systems so that each term is handled in one of the proof systems by shuffling these things around.
So what I actually didn't intend to do, but just want to tell you, is that if you look at the ice proof system, what you'll do is you'll put the, the one question on the left side in position i, and then you'll make all the other guys y, and it turns out that you can bound all coefficients that contain i. And this it requires some work. This you can't do by Fourier expansion, but you have to do these invariance principles and, and, and so forth. You know, what happens if you just if you put x always in the same place and you permute the y's? Um, Why does it, doesn't this work? I should know. No, no the, so the, the point is if you look at something that only contains y positions, uh -huh. okay? that actually appears in the Fourier expansion of the predicate itself. That has to be big in the honest proof. Yeah, yeah, but then when, when I permute it, it's going to correspond to yeah, the set of but, but still, look at an honest proof and look at a, at a dishonest proof, right? So uh, look at the dishonest proof, it have inconsistent long codes everywhere. Uh -huh. That thing has to survive. I mean, if you're looking at a term that doesn't contain anything from the x side, you know, Positions that just contain y variables, they will look exactly the same in the honest proof and, and, the, uh, and this cheating proof with inconsistent long codes. So that term has to be bad, you know, it's, we can't fool it somehow, it looks the same in both proofs. So that's why you need x and y's in, in, in sort of all positions, because you have to make use of this consistency. Okay? And I don't know, I, I, I can't even do this proof standing now, so there's no option, but you know, this is how the proof ends. So the great invention is, you know, to have this proof, you need sort of a new era of proofs that you can, that the idea that you can take proof of proof systems and handle the terms in different proofs, and that sort of it was the great idea that we didn't have before. Okay. Any questions on this? Um, so the last thing I want to do is something a little bit different, or it's a little bit similar, or depending on how you view it. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll just change gears a little bit on a different type of approximability. So we'll have a case set formula, and this is going to be exactly case set. So we'll have you know. And I promise you, exist satisfying assignment. That satisfies L, L literals in each clause. And your task is not now to find something that satisfies L literals in each clause, but satisfies in the normal sense. So for instance, in the standard case where L is equal to 1, if you know K is equal to 3, it's empty hard, but if L is equal to K is equal to 2, it's polynomial time. So for which values of K and L is this empty hard is now my question. So it's an approximation in a different dimension. L over 2, K over 2 is What? Should be K over 2 somehow. Should be K over 2, okay. And uh, you want an apple? Maybe sure. <laughs> Yeah, so why k over 2? Because otherwise some random walk thing should walk out. Mm hmm Okay. So, what you're saying that, could you, uh, what's the random thing, walk thing that would work out? I mean, 
when you have, I, I don't really see, but there should be a bias if you resample, and if you if you have a bad clothes and you resample by. by you you never saw this before. What? No. There's an algorithm about by by Christos, right? You don't, yeah, the, the simple version. That's the, the Christos algorithm for two sets. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And the point is that the Christos two set algorithm works, right? So, 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 sorry, I didn't understand this. So I'll tell you what, what's the Christos two set algorithm. Is that take any take any unsat Suppose you have a satisfy a two set format that's satisfiable, and the following algorithm: take an unsatisfied clause and flip one of its variables. Okay. So how many people saw this algorithm before? Okay. So if you didn't, I'll I'll repeat it. And analyze. It's sort of a, it's a very cute algorithm, right? So is it the same as Schrodinger's algorithm, or what? Is it the same as Schrodinger's no, algorithm? No, 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 no. So this is for two set. Uh, start with something arbitrary. Take a not satisfied clause. So, so I'll say it more carefully. Okay. So, so as long as it's not satisfied, take an unsatisfied clause, randomly flip one of its two variables. This is very similar to the constructive version of Adash local language. Oh, sorry, Lovash local language. Yes, but this is much simpler, right? So let's. So now, how do you analyze? But take any satisfying assignment and look at the distance from from the thing that we have. Well, since this is satisfying, it must be different in one of these two variables. And in the worst case, it's, this it's different in both, and then we actually are sure we're going to make progress. But otherwise, it, you, you know, it's an unbiased random walk. Well, normally, it's if you look at the distance to any point, it's not an unbiased random walk. When we're starting to get closer, we just flip something randomly. We're, Likely to move away, right? So this is an unbiased random walk. And then you sort of think, well, if you have lots of satisfying assignments, how can it be that unbiased random walk towards all of them? But once you've hit the first one, you sort of get stuck and you don't move any further. So it's, it's so then, when does this work? What? In, in more general. Yeah. Well, as you said. Right, so if, as long as the number of satisfied clauses is at least half, this would be an unbiased random walk and sort of works. Can you make this deterministic? This is a good homework problem. So this is just not a method of conditional expectation? No, I don't know how to make this random walk. So if L is strictly greater than so
So if L is actually greater than k over 2 over, then you, you set up the corresponding L phi. So we, if we have, say, 3 out of 5 set, and we have a clause that looks Then we take any clause and say, well, three of its variables should be satisfied. Then, um, and then we, this is a solvable LP because it's solvable by zero one, and then we find a zero, and, but then, in fact, anything that's greater than a half will round to true, and it has to be one variable in each of things because L is actually strictly greater than K over two. On the other hand, when L is exactly K over two, you, all variables equal to one half is a solution to this LP, so this LP is not so useful. And then you have to do something more, but you can make it determine. I don't. If I, you can think about it while I'm talking. But you know, you can fix also k equal to exactly l exactly k. So do you think it's hard? Otherwise, and how do you prove this? Um, I mean, it's, if the ratio is really high, you can just encode the standard three sides. Like if it's greater than two k over two two thirds or something, right? But, uh, <laughs> Well, <coughs> so if, if k is, if l is great, less than k over three, we can in fact just start with a three set instance. You know, if k is six, and we ask two two variables to Literals will be true in each clause. We start with a three set formula, make two co you know, the all pairwise copies, and we're done. Okay. So the question is the interesting question is really between a third and a half. Okay. So the first interesting question is two out of five set. Okay. So that, you know, k is equal to five, a l is equal to two. And I thought this would be a great starting point for reductions to get better approximability results. So this is now approximation in a different sense. It's sort of the worst local situation rather than sort of the, the, the number of constraints we satisfy. And the funny thing is the only way we, we could prove that this was empty hard was actually through a label cover uh, thingy. And it, I searched the literature a little bit, but then when you prove it yourself, you hope that nobody else proved it, but, and I asked some people. Did anybody see this? So I want to prove that this is NP-hard. You mean no approximation involved whatsoever? Yeah, so that's a good question I'll say at the end. I don't get any approximation of this. You know, it's, I can't uh, count the number of satisfied uh, clauses, just that there will be some falsified clauses. I thought that NP-hardness can be always proven in gadget reduction. Yeah, so let's, let's prove, yeah. So that's a, got another, yeah. Gadget reduction would always give some in approximability. So I'll, I'll let me prove this theorem, okay? This, this is NP-hard. This is NP-hard. So this is un now unpublished. It's not clear who it's by because, you know, we haven't really seen how far we can push this. So this is it's possibly by me, Perastrin and Venkat Gurushwami, but it might be a different list of authors when the smoke clears. Okay? So, so. <coughs> <laughs> or or let's put it like this
Yeah, may I think you will get some in a proxy bit. We'll, we'll see. So now we want a reduction for this. Just to make perfect, so satisfy two means at least two, right? Uh, sorry, yes, yeah, thank you. You like apples, right? Say again? You like apples? Yeah, yeah, but it's too early in the day. Uh -huh. Keep okay. one for that. Uh, so how do we prove this? So we'll start with our favorite label cover. So we'll do all natural clauses, okay? So we'll take, you know, we know we, how we should take these inputs, so we'll take five such inputs and we'll make sure that two coordinates are true in each of the, in each of the co coordinates, at least two of the five strings is true, okay? Yeah, so are we starting the level cover or after yeah. applying the long code? Yeah, we, yeah, we have, of course, yeah, sorry, yeah. And the long code, we, have, we long code things, of course, okay. yes, sorry. Yeah, so we have the, these long codes, okay? And And we uh, we do the same sort of internal test for for what for for g sub w, each g sub w. We take five guys here, and finally we'll take x one, x two. Let's call it y three, y four, y five. Let's start x1 pi x2 pi y3 pi pi You just do the natural test, you know, you test the long codes individually and you do the natural test across. And I'm uh, sorry, uh, I forget, everything of course is folded. Uh, right? We're, we're in a, we have a five sets, we have negation, so we, 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 are, we fold these things. So 
So then I claim that now you want to prove a lemma that says if f satisfies all the f clauses, you know, all the clauses of this type, and it actually depends. So f is a function, right? If it depends on the i's and the j's the coordinate, then in fact it's one whenever these coordinates are one. That's the only. Mm. What do you mean depends? So it could be co in, uh, it could depend only on the other ones and be const uh, be constant whatever x and x j are. So I, that's not that's not the case. No. So what what I mean by depend? The influence is non-zero. Yes. So I, I I mean that it exists an x one such so that f of x one is not equal to f of x1 this is depends on mm -hmm. right so there's some input where we flip it okay okay and there's another input then such that f of x2 so this is so let me prove this this is a very simple proof it's just So we have, you know, two inputs, x1 and x2. Uh, so let's assume just that this, in fact, is minus one true. Okay. So this, otherwise, I can just reverse the roles of the two things. Okay. So this means that this, in fact, is equal to this. Okay. Uh, I should have done the other way around. These are actually ones. Okay. Now we just look at this five tuple, and I think it, I claim it's a legitimate five tuple for our test. So x is any arbitrary input. X, x is an arbitrary input, which I'm trying to prove this. And x one and x two are the ones where the where the both. X one and x two are the two things here. So if you l these two strings are complementary almost everywhere, right? Except in position i, and these are complementary except in position j. So if you look at any position except i and j, these four guys have two true ones values because they're complements. And if you look at position i, well, this is true, and uh, one of these guys is true. So two of them are true. And for the same reason, two of them have xj equal to minus 1. But now, f applied to these things, if you apply f to these things, you have one, 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 one. So for this to, to survive the test and actually be satisfiable, f of x has to be true. Yes? So there's no gadgeted action just to, to three sets? I don't know. I couldn't find one. I worked for two days. I couldn't find one. So what happens if you look at three sets and two variables, y and z, and then the next clause is going to have exactly the same three sets and then complement of y and complement of z? What? So you look at x1, or x2, or x3. Just a guess, I'm not sure. That's the, the three set clause, and then you have two more variables, y and z. And in one case, you're going to take y and z positive, and in the other case, you're going to take both of them negative. So doesn't it, doesn't it go that? What? You're, yeah, so would you have x1, x2, x3? Right, and you want to add two new variables, y1 and y2. Yes. And in the new clauses, you have, in one case, you're going to have x1 or x2 or x3. You're going to have 2 to 5. It's x1, x2, x3, and y1, y2. And in the other one, you're going to but have a complement of y1, y2. So it's never worth for you to have the two variables, but it's, if you know, it's, you can have one of the variables, and then you, isn't, doesn't this reduce it to three sets? Mm -hmm. 
This was such a nice proof. Um, so you're saying? So the completeness is fine. What happens with these elements? So you're saying we should add? Right, do you have no, no, no. Right? This I can always satisfy by doing just auxiliary variables, right? If you do want to. I mean, I, you're asked to just find a satisfying assignment to this new thing you produce. Yeah, but why are they the same in both clauses? Yeah, but it's yeah, but you said one, you said one, through, through, one false. through and one false, and then you satisfy both satisfied. these clauses. You said one through. You said one through and one false. These are two to five clauses, so you are supposed to satisfy at least two. No, 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 no you're not supposed to satisfy. Ah. I mean, you're guaranteed that the two is satisfiable, and you just need to satisfy one, right? Oh, That's okay. the point. Okay. You're asked to just satisfy. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, good. <laughs> Take yourself a nap in your Yeah, I, 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 I think I need a chocolate there. <laughs> an apple is healthy. And that's what we get here, right? The four, to satisfy even one, we have to make sure that, because all the four guys are, are four. Hmm. <laughs> So I claim that the lemma is fine. Yeah. The corollary is that yeah. so that means that f actually depends on at most three variables. Uh, because if it depended on four things. So if it depends on x1, x2, x3, x4, if you look at inputs that has that's 1, 1, 0, 0, then it should be 1, the, it should be true by the lemma, but sorry. No, I, if you look at 1, 1, minus 1, 1, this should be minus 1. I'm sort of, I try to be consistent. Minus 1 being true is so, so counterintuitive, but so nice. Yeah, so if you look at these two, it sort of dictates this to be minus 1. But if you negate this thing, these two dictate it to be minus 1. And in fact, um, yeah, so that can't be determined three, right? And the funny thing is that that if you take the majority of three guys, it's like it doesn't have to be a long code. If you take the majority of three guys, it actually contains, it, it survives this test. It satisfies at least, but it's, it's this is sharp. But now this is now we're sort of fine because G also survives the test, so G only depends on three variables. And then it's easy to see if the three variables that G pre depends on and the three variables F project on, if there's no if. If they're not consistent on the projection, I mean, if there's none of the elements that G project on that, that F depends on, then in fact it's easy to violate these clauses. Should I write? Um, sorry, let me write it down. Thank you. 
So I claim that if you know F and G survives and we have what survival cr cross clauses, then I claim that there exists a labeling that satisfies at least a ninth of, of all the, the uh, label conditions. Why is this? Well, suppose Fu depends on Xi1, Xi2, Xi3. G depends on J1, Xj2. Right, so I claim that if if there's no consistency between the projections, it's very easy to find the inputs here. I, I wasn't even going to prove this, but you don't look happy enough. Right, I just have to find inputs here such that each, and then I'm going to ask, right, f of x1, I make a clause of f of x1, f of x2. G of y3, G of y4. But these depend on completely, I mean, these depend on completely different variables and that doesn't project onto what these depend on. So it's very easy to just construct x and y so that screws this up. And then we're done. Because that will say, if you just take a random variable on which it depends, we'll get at least at nines, and, and, and then we're done. And then, in fact, you just need a label cover with one ninth soundness, which is just some finite label cover. So I suppose we get some mean approximability in the end. But it's a very minute, it's a incredibly small constant. Um, so. So you are looking at a particular problem where there is a notion of strongly a clause is strongly satisfied and the clause is weakly satisfied, mm -hmm. and then you create a promise problem out of this. Yes. So, so this could be done like more generally, but does this do these kind of problems? I mean, are these kind of problems kind of the same as CSPs? Like no, no. For instance, does dichotomy hold or...? So let me tell you my reason for... So this is now a completely different problem. It's not a CSP anymore. Of course now we can start saying things, you know, suppose this is perfectly satisfiable, what fraction can you do, blah, blah, blah. But my, the reason I wanted this problem is I wanted this as a starting point for a job scheduling hardness, right? So what's your job scheduling, right? You have lots of machines and the question is what's the maximum running time of all the machines? which is a very different problem from a max CSP problem because it's sort of you're looking at the worst local situation, you know, which machine is the most loaded. And then I thought this would be an excellent starting point because here we're sort of looking at the worst local situation, you know, which clause has the fewest true literals. And so then I wanted this problem and then we managed to prove this problem but then we couldn't get the scheduling <laughs> problems as a reduction from it. So the hope is that I'm telling you guys you now get a new fresh tool that nobody has and you should use this for reductions, yes. I guess, I guess philosophically it's also like related to the question is where is the hardness of the sat problem? Is it a two or is it a three? Yeah. And the philosophy is that it should be a two and therefore, you know, this shouldn't just, it should be even for larger numbers, you know, whenever you're above the half threshold, you should, it should be hard. So you know how to prove that or not yet? I mean, for other values, not two out of five. So three out of seven? For example. Yeah, the same proof works. The same. Yeah, yeah, so I forgot to say this. You, 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 
learning. So yeah, so this proof, if you just think about it, it works for any, right? If I start with three, then in fact f will only, de if, if it depends on, on any particular three coordinates, then you can do exactly the same trick with the pairs and then it just works. Sorry, yeah, so, so this sort of completely answers the question of L versus K sets. You know, if L is at least K over two, it's easy, and if it's strictly less than K over two, it's not going to be hard. Which I felt was fairly satisfying. Yes? So if the plus satisfies K over two literals, and you're actually finding the same thing that satisfies K over two, or just some satisfying? You just find some satisfying, because this, these algorithms sort of, like Papa Demetrius, if you run it once you've satisfied all the clauses, you, don't, you, you can't make progress. And it sort of would be natural because otherwise you could probably solve this. I mean, what sort of remains is a little bit a smaller problem, right? Suppose I start with a particular problem and I just add, add uh, you know, increase k to k plus one and l to l plus one by just adding one through, then that shouldn't work. Uh, yeah, so um, that was actually the end of the things I was planning to say. So I think I'll just give you a longer break.